thank you for joining the uh, NSDF webinar this morning. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional land that we each gather upon today. Um, my name is Nicole LeBlanc. I am with the Stakeholder Relations Group at CNL, and I will just take you through a couple housekeeping items as we start our webinar. So if you are not familiar with the Zoom platform, you have the option of listening in English language or French. Um, everyone will have a little bit of a different view depending on the type of device you are um, viewing the webinar on. Uh, but you'll either have uh, an interpretation button that you can click on and choose your language option, or you may just have an English and French option right already on your screen. Um, today we'll have uh, Sandra Fott, um, who is our NSDF Manager um, of Regulatory Affairs. Uh, I'll introduce Sandra in a few moments. Uh, she will go through a short introduction, which will be followed by a video, and then we'll have a Q&A session. We ask if you have a question that you'd like to ask. Uh, again, depending on your viewing device, you'll have a Q&A icon. You'll be able to type any questions into the Q&A uh, section, uh, but we will keep all of those questions until the end of the video. So once the video finishes and Sandra comes back online, I will verbally read the questions to Sandra uh, so that she can answer them for everyone to hear and to uh, include our simultaneous translation depending on uh, which language you happen to be listening in. So uh, that takes care of our housekeeping items. Um, again, thank you for joining us and Sandra, over to you. All right, thanks, Nicole, and good morning, everyone. And thanks for taking time out of your day today to join us to learn more about the proposed near surface disposal facility project. Um, this webinar is part of a series that we've been doing approximately quarterly since the fall of 2018. Our more recent webinars are available to watch on the CNL YouTube channel, which you can access through our website, um, including the last one where we discussed uh, the alternative options analysis that we conducted for the environmental assessment. So like Nicole mentioned, today's webinar is a little different as we're going to take you on a virtual tour of the NSDF site. So this was filmed a few weeks ago on August 24th, and we've definitely seen a shift in weather since that day. Uh, the video is just over 20 minutes long, so it's not too long to sit through. But before we get started, I wanted to provide you a brief update on where the NSDF project currently is in the environmental assessment process. In our December 2019 webinar, we announced that CNL had submitted to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, or the CNSC, a revised draft environmental impact statement and responses to approximately 250 technical comments on the 2017 draft environmental impact statement that we received from the Federal Provincial Review Team. So that Federal Provincial Re Review Team included other federal departments, such as uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Health Canada and Natural Resources, as well as provincial ministries of environment from both Quebec and Ontario. In April, we received uh, 37 information requests back from this team. We are currently down to two outstanding comments for resolution, which we will be responding to by the end of this month. Following acceptance of these, we will submit responses to the over 600 public and Indigenous comments, and these will be verified uh, for completeness by the CMSC staff. Pending acceptance of these, we would be looking to submit our final EIS this fall. This would have us looking at the first part of, uh, for the first part of the commission hearing in the spring of 2021. So with that, I will now ask that we start the video. So enjoy the tour. Yeah. So right now we're standing just inside the gates of the Chalk River Labs. Um, you might hear a little bit of traffic and um, back backup beeps going on. There's a little bit of everyone. I'm Sandra Fodd. I'm the manager of NSDF regulatory approvals and one of the best parts of my job is to be able to get out in the field and show people the NSDF site. 
Um, with COVID-19, we haven't been able to get people out. So uh, Mike uh, is with me today and we're going to take you guys on a virtual tour of uh, the NSDF. So right now we're standing just inside the gates of the Chalk River Labs. Um, you might hear a little bit of traffic and um, ba backup beeps going on. There's a little bit of construction around us. But um, the Chalk River Labs itself is about 4,000 hectares. A lot of it is forested, like you see behind me. Uh, the NSDF site will be about 37 hectares of our, of our 4,000. Um, there's about 3,000 employees that work at the Chalk River Labs. So uh, every day we've got engineers, we've got skilled trades, we've got um, administrative staff, um, all kinds of people coming here to work at the lab. And we're super proud of it, and we're super happy to be able to show you the project site today. All right, so Mike and I are making our way down Plant Road. It is about nine kilometers from the Chalk River Gate to the uh, Chalk River Lab site. And I'd say we're about halfway down right now. Um, along the way, we saw two wild turkeys along the side of the road. Uh, the Chalk River site has lots of wildlife and uh, approximately 21 different species at risk. So today we've invited uh, one of our environmental specialists, Annie Moran, to talk a little bit about uh, the turtle culverts that we've put in, or as I call it, the turtle highway. So Annie's going to come in and explain a little bit what the culverts are for and some other work that we're doing here to uh, protect species at risk. Merci beaucoup, Sandra. Donc, comme Sandra le mentionnait, au site de Chalk River, nous avons environ une vingtaine d'espèces en péril, dont la tortue mouchetée. La petite population de tortues mouchetées au site de Chalk River est menacée par euh, la densité de trafic que l'on a sur euh, notre route principale. Donc c'est pour cette raison qu'on a décidé cette année euh, de, de créer des, euh, des passages euh, pour les, les, les tortues, la tortue mouchetée, mais aussi toutes les espèces de tortues. Donc euh, nos passages à tortues incluent euh, une, euh, comme un grand passage avec beaucoup de lumière. Euh, un tunnel avec un système de clôture pour amener les tortues à passer euh, au travers euh, de la calvette. Donc, en créant euh, ces passages à tortues, on espère éliminer euh, la mortalité sur les routes pour la tortue mouchetée, mais aussi toutes les espèces de tortues. Dans le cadre du projet de gestion des déchets près de la surface, puisqu'il va y avoir une augmentation du trafic, on espère aussi euh, éliminer encore plus euh, ou éliminer complètement la mortalité des tortues sur les routes euh, en, en créant quatre autres passages comme celui-ci euh, sur le site de Chalk River. Comme ça, les tortues euh, vont pouvoir utiliser les passages au lieu de traverser pour aller à leurs différents habitats en, habitat en utilisant euh, la route. Aussi, pendant le projet de gestion des déchets près de la surface, on a aussi des, des mesures d'atténuation qui sont spécifiques au projet qui inclut euh, des barrières physiques et aussi des restrictions au niveau euh, du temps de l'année auquel certaines opérations peuvent être euh, entreprises. Et on a aussi euh, des, euh, des inventaires ou des, de la surveillance qui va se faire de, à tous les jours pour s'assurer que les tortues ne sont pas sur, euh, sur le site de construction. All right, so Mike and I have continued to make our way down Plant Road, and right now we're about a kilometer from the main Chalk River site. And right where we're standing is, behind us is Waste Management Area A. Waste Management Area A uh, is Canada's first nuclear waste management area. So this site was opened in about 1945-1946, and waste continued to be in place in this area until about 1981. In Waste Management Area A, they mainly use sand trenches. So um, not a lot of uh, containment from the environment. Beside us is the liquid dispersal area and sort of the same thing. Uh, waste that went into the liquid dispersal area was put into the sand trenches. 90% um, of the waste that's proposed to go into the NSDF is here on the Chalk River site. And these two areas are examples of waste um, that should the project be approved, we would be able to um, get away from being in the sand trenches and put into uh, containment in the NSDF. So there are a number of groundwater monitoring wells um, that are behind me um, and the groundwater monitoring wells were actually installed uh, back in the 1950s. So the Chalk River Laboratories is actually known as the birthplace of contaminant hydrology. So as um, 
We'll hear more from Annie later about all of the environmental monitoring that happens on the Chalk River site. But um, this is, we have uh, groundwater data from this area in the Perch Lake Basin since the 1950s. So the groundwater movement in the Perch Lake Basin where the NSDF site is, is well understood. All right, so now we're at the uh, boundary of the uh, NSDF project site. Um, just behind me is the Plant Road, so it's not too far off of Plant Road that the, uh, the project site will be. Um, when siting for the NSDF, we actually looked at 15 different sites on the Chalk River Lab site. Um, these sites were looked at with mandatory criteria, such as we needed a minimum amount of uh, space, um, we needed access to power and other services. So from that mandatory criteria, then we also had exclusion criteria. So some of the exclusion criteria would be the presence of species at risk, um, whether or not the, the project site was in a floodplain and we looked at geotechnical considerations. So once we looked at the mandatory and exclusion criteria, two sites were evaluated further for the NSDF. Um, so of the two sites, both were technically feasible, but the chosen site, which is on East Mattawa Road, which is what we're standing on right now, was preferred um, because this area is within the Perch Lake Basin. So it has been historically impacted by other waste management areas areas. As well, as I explained earlier, the Perch Lake Basin has been monitored um, since the 1950s. So um, within this area, uh, the groundwater, the surface water, everything is very well understood. The alternative site, uh, which is in the Chalk Lake Basin, is in a non-impacted area. And it actually, um, even though uh, it looks on a map that it's further away from the Ottawa River, the drainage time from the Chalk River Lake Basin to the Ottawa River is shorter than what we have in the Perch Lake Basin. So uh, what we're going to see when we climb the hill here in a few minutes is uh, a groundwater ridge divide that's on top of the uh, NSDF project site and uh, we'll be able to see a little bit better how the groundwater is going to move away from the river. All right, so Mike and I have made our way up the ridge and uh, so we're now standing at the top and I'm going to use my notes a little bit because I have a lot to say up here. So behind me is the Ottawa River and we are about 1.2 kilometers to the river um, as the crow flies. Behind Mike is the village of Chalk River and it's a little bit hazy but from here you can see the water tower which is probably about 10 kilometers from here. One of the things when we were siting for NSDF was that we did not want the NSDF project site to be visible from either the village of Chalk River or from the Ottawa River. So this ridge actually will provide um, a little bit of a, a shield from any visibility to uh, the project site. Um, we are currently at about 193 meters above sea level and the Ottawa River is typically at about 115 meters above sea level. For the floodplain uh, studies that we've done, we've used 123 meters above sea level, kind of as the maximum flood scenario that we, we might see. And that is um, a breakage of three dams upstream of the Chalk River site. So we are well above any uh, worst case scenario for flooding. Um, so we are at a high point, but even at the low point of the engineered containment mound, we're still at about 150 meters above sea level. Uh, we do have a bat box up here, and um, Annie's going to talk a little bit more about bats when we head down to Perch Lake in a few minutes. Um, so I won't touch much on that, but the bat box up here on the ridge is currently being occupied um, by uh, three different species of bats that we have at the site. Um, just over to the right will be where the wastewater treatment plant is going to be constructed. So the wastewater treatment plant will um, treat leachate that's collected from the engineered containment mound as well as any leachate that comes off of the decontamination facilities. There's going to be an exfiltration gallery uh, where the discharge from the wastewater treatment plant goes. All discharge, all effluent will be tested prior to discharge to make sure that it meets effluent discharge targets. Uh, if it doesn't meet those targets, it will be recirculated back through the plant uh, until those targets are met. 
Um, in the case of any uh, high water tables with the exfiltration gallery, we are going to have a backup discharge pipe to uh, direct discharge to the perch lake. Uh, we are currently working with Ducks Unlimited and looking at uh, using different components of artificial wetlands in our design around the exfiltration gallery. So that's just another uh, way that we can um, enhance water quality from the discharge of the water treatment plant. We are on a groundwater divide here, uh, so it's not really intuitive, but uh, sort of behind me, water does flow down towards the river, but the NSDF project site is behind Mike, so behind the camera, and water uh, from here flows downhill towards uh, Perch Lake and Perch Creek. Um, so it isn't really intuitive that on a map we look so close to the Ottawa River, yet the groundwater and water flows um, in the opposite direction. What's important about that is we know from our groundwater modeling studies that the transit time from this area to Perch Creek is be somewhere between 7 and 12 years. So in the very unlikely event that there was um, any issues with groundwater detected through the monitoring program, we would have lots of time to come up with mitigation measures to uh, stop any um, potential releases off the Chalk River site. Uh, we are on bedrock up here, so there will be some blasting that needs to be done. Um, and we will be using the rock that we blast from this area to construct the engineered containment mound. Um, from up here, uh, water, gravity, the uh, effluent discharge will flow by gravity down to the uh, perch uh, lake and the engineered containment mound will have to pump leachate up into the water treatment plant. We've installed about 30 new groundwater monitoring wells up on this ridge. So again, we have uh, lots of good baseline data. Uh, both this was done to look at bedrock characteristics as well as um, groundwater. So we are continuing to monitor these wells for groundwater quality, um, but this area up here is currently unaffected. So Mike and I are going to head back down the hill now and uh, we're going to meet up with Annie at uh, Perch Lake to talk a little bit about um, the CNL Environmental Monitoring Program, about the bats and about um, biodiversity in Perch Lake. As mentioned by Sandra, we are now on the side of Perch Lake. So Perch Lake is located south of the proposed boundary of the near surface disposal facility. So we have conducted uh, several surveys in the lake and around the lake. And a fish uh, survey conducted a few years ago demonstrated that the fish community is fairly diverse in, in the lake. And an interesting fact is that the survey we conducted a few years ago, the species composition is also very similar to a fish survey conducted in 1980 uh, by the Waterloo University. This lake also hosts uh, several uh, turtle species such as the painted turtle and the snapping turtle. And we are currently at the outlet of Perch Lake, so Perch Lake is flowing into Perch Creek. So this location is also a very important location for the, as part of the environmental monitoring program of the Chalk River site. So the Chalk River Environmental Monitoring Program has been ongoing for over 60 years. We collect about over 5,000 effluent samples every year, conduct over 20,000 analysis every year, and this location is part of this, of this program. So it is a very important location because uh, Perch Creek will then flow into the Ottawa River, so we do have one additional monitoring station before the water is released uh, to the Ottawa River. We do monitor for a suite of contaminants, uh, radionuclides and other contaminants such as mercury or lead, and uh, the monitor monitoring program follows the N288.4 standard, CSA standard. At this location as well, we do have a bad box, or a couple of bad boxes. So as part of the NSDF project, we have installed in eight different locations, 16 bad boxes. So every location has two bad boxes back to back. And uh, the locations are all in the outside of the proposed boundary of the near surface disposal facility. So the bad boxes were installed in 2017. 
first uh, occupancy was detected in 2018 with just a few bats using the bat boxes and as of last year in 2019 really the occupancy went up in the bat boxes so we have installed the bat boxes very early on because we wanted to make sure that there was an overlap with the bat boxes uh, if the NSDF project was going forward and the bat habitat removal that uh, the NSDF project would cause uh, if it goes forward. So the, the bad boxes, uh, as the years go by, so this year, for example, we do have uh, bad boxes with an occupancy of over 40 uh, bats, and uh, the ba a bad box can have over 300 bucks. We were able to confirm that the bad boxes were used as a maternity ruse because we confirmed that there is non-volant individual in the, in the box. And we are also engaged with Trent University with the telemetry project on the bat at Chalk River. So bat bo bats that were uh, captured last year and tracked, uh, their movement were tracked for several days, confirmed that a bat can use a bat box and a natural environment interchangeably. So this information is very interesting because we will be able to take uh, the movement pattern of the bats and habitat preference and we will feed this into a sustainable forest management plan that we are currently developing with the Canadian Forest Service for the Chalk River site. So by engaging or by uh, producing a sustainable forest management plan for the site, we are hoping well, the goal is to make sure that we maintain or enhance uh, wildlife habitat on the Chalk River property, including habitat for the bat species at risk that are present here at the Chalk River site. So we've stopped now at a test pit that has been left exposed from the archaeological assessment that we did as part of the NSDF project uh, environmental assessment. The archaeological assessment was done in four stages um, with the third three stages were actual field work and throughout that field work they did 10,000 test pits similar to what you see behind me and recovered about 5,000 different artifacts. Those artifacts were uh, small tools, and um, stone scatters. So it was evidence that there were small campsites or workshops and quarries in this area. But overall, the conclusion of the archaeological assessment was that um, there was nothing of cultural significance found within the NSDF project site footprint, and no further archaeological work is uh, recommended. So now we're at um, a dust monitoring station. So behind me are high volume air samplers. We installed these uh, air sampling um, stations a couple years ago. So we've been collecting baseline data and um, are continuing to do that this summer as well. Um, these are part of the environmental protection plan for the NSDF project. Uh, there's two sets of them. This is the downstream location and there's another one uh, which is considered upstream on uh, the plant road side of the project site. Um, when uh, we are operating the NSDF project during construction and operation. There will be uh, mitigation measures in place to control dust. So these are uh, verification that uh, our mitigation measures are being effective. The uh, air sampling equipment does, uh, has filters inside it, so we do measure for radiologicals and non-radiologicals uh, at a third party laboratory um, for accuracy. So we're at the end of the tour now and Mike and I are at uh, Point Obabtem. Point Obabtem is a publicly accessible beach along the Ottawa River. So many families like to come here, park their boat, swim, have a picnic and enjoy the day here. As employees of the Chalk River site, protection of the Ottawa River is very important to us because we do live here, we play here, we drink water out of the river and we fish. Um, CNL has, a, as Andy has mentioned a very robust environmental monitoring program which does include the Ottawa River and will include the Ottawa River going forward with the NSDF project. Um, all results from our environmental monitoring program are publicly available on the CNL website. You will see behind me the uh, Chalk River Lab main site and just to the right is the outlet of Perch Creek. 
Um, so I really want to thank you for taking part in this tour today. Like I said, this is one of the best parts of my job and um, it's really unfortunate that you can't be here. It is absolutely a stunning day to be here in the Ottawa Valley. Uh, before we go, I just want Mike to come in so that you guys know I haven't been talking to myself this whole time. So thank you again, everyone. And I'm gonna hook up with Megan now and we're gonna take any questions that you might have about the project. Have a great day. Okay, thank you, Sandra, for the video. We do have some questions in the queue. So I'll just go through them one at a time. So our first one is from Ole Hendrickson. The NSDF would include commercial waste such, such as disused sealed sources according to the waste acceptance criteria. Can CNL provide an inventory, radionuclides such as cobalt-60 and cesium-137 and amounts of radioactivity for each for these commercial wastes? Okay, thanks for the question, Ole. That's a great question. Uh, so just to start off, 90% um, of the waste that we're currently um, projecting to go into the NSDF is on the, NS, on the CRL site right now. Um, it's about 5% of waste proposed for the NSDF that's coming from commercial sources. Um, so like Ole mentions, regardless of the source, the waste will need to be characterized to ensure that it meets the waste acceptance criteria. Um, the reference inventory itself includes total radioactivity from uh, all sources and it's not separated by source. So um, in an, other words, we don't describe limits on an individual package, but overall uh, the waste has to meet the waste acceptance criteria. Okay, thank you, Sandra. And we have another couple questions from uh, Ole as well. So the original environmental impact statement or EIS and the revised EIS have very different waste radionuclide inventories. For example, the inventory in the original EIS has no thorium, but this would be the largest radioactive, sorry, the largest radionuclide in terms of mass in the revised inventory. Could you please explain how the two inventories were done and why they differ so much? Okay, another great question. Um, so the biggest difference in the two inventories was actually the removal of intermediate level wastes from our 2017 um, proposed inventory. Um, so following uh, the removal of the ILW, we used an iterative approach within the post-closure safety assessment to ensure the long-term safety of the NSDF. Um, so the reference inventory that we've come up with considers all wastes uh, that we currently have and that we are forecasted at the time of closure. Uh, we will characterize this waste and track the cumulative inventory compared to the reference inventory over time. Um, so again, the, the changes were done through an iterative process um, between the post-closure safety assessment, the reference inventory and the WAC, and um, we ended up uh, with a current reference inventory based on the long-term safety. Thank you, Sandra. Our next question is from Teresa McLennan, McLennan and I hope I've got that right. Um, can you address whether and how the public can access all of the current and prior monitoring information at Perch Creek? Uh, sure. So um, currently, uh, CNL at the Track River Labs conducts a very extensive environmental monitoring program. And our environmental monitoring uh, data results are posted on the CNL website. Um, we can provide a link to that uh, after this webinar uh, for you. Um, in the EIS itself, we have summarized um, the, the data that we currently have on Perch Creek and Perch Lake, as well as the Ottawa River as part of the EIS, as this is part of our baseline data. So all environmental monitoring data uh, for the Chalk River Labs is publicly available. Okay, 
And another one from Ole. Uh, Sandra, you said you would use the rock blasted from the NSDF site to construct the mound. Could you explain in more detail how the rock would be used in the mound? Um, thanks, all. So um, essentially within our design, there are um, different components of the engineered containment mound that, that do, do use rock. So one example would be the perimeter berm. So what the plan is, is to um, use the rock and bring in rock crushers to the uh, NSDF project site in order to be able to, to, make, to utilize what we're taking out of the, the ground in our design. Um, so the, um, the rock that we use was still have to meet the uh, QAQC requirements, um, such as uh, the size of the rock uh, required, uh, but we do want to use what we have here. Okay, and our next question. This is actually from William Turner. Why would you want to pump, pump leachate uphill? What are the contingencies if those pumps fail? Will the leachate pool at the bottom of the hill? Uh, good question. So um, we basically need to pump because of, uh, of gravity. Um, so the engineered containment mound is being built on a downward slope. So the water will go to um, the bottom portion of the, uh, the mound and need to get pumped back up. Um, we do have contingencies in place, such as backup pumps, backup generators, that kind of thing. Um, in the case that we did have a problem with a pump, uh, we can use the engineered containment mound to safely store any leachate or contact water. So um, as the cells are being constructed, we will only have one cell open at a time and we will be putting a sacrificial layer on each cell as it's completed in order to limit as much as possible the amount of contact water or leachate. But um, in the case that we did have a problem with a pump, we will have lots of storage within, within the ECM and to ensure that nothing gets released to the environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Teresa. What are the three species of bats currently using the bat boxes? Now, Sandra, right. I know this is Annie's uh, area, but I'm not sure if you can answer this or we can provide a written response to Teresa. I actually do have it in my notes. Um, so the three species of the bats we have are the little brown myotis bat, the northern myotis bat, uh, the tricolored bat, and we also have uh, the eastern small-footed foot myotis bat at the Chalk River site. Um, from what I understood last summer, there were three species using the bat box, um, and I'm, I don't know this year with the, there, there's been limited monitoring done if that fourth species is using the box yet or not. Great. Uh, another question from Ole. There are lots of freshwater mussels in the vicinity of the Perch Creek outlet and Pointe au Baptême. Can you provide strontium-90 data for them? Uh, so that will be a question I will have to take back to the environmental monitoring um, team, um, but we can get back to Ole on that one. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. Okay, so Ole will take an action to follow up with you on that. Okay. Sorry, I just have to scroll. Um, oh, that's okay. I'm glad there's Teresa. lots of questions. <laughs> Another one from Teresa. Is the inventory and report of the archaeological study available for review? Yeah, so the reference inventory report, um, I know for sure, is on the CNL website. Um, and Nicole, I'd have to double check whether the archaeological report is on the website or um, we can definitely provide it by email. Great, thank you. Uh, so we can send Teresa those links. Okay, and I can do that, Teresa. Uh, we have one from Jeanette Charbonneau. So how will you control emission from dust during construction on the site and refilling activities? All right, so um, we do have a, a dust management plan that we will use for construction and operations. Um, so there's lots of things that we can do to mitigate dust. Uh, so things like uh, using water trucks to water down um, the roads or stockpiles, um, ensuring that our traffic 
uh, complies with uh, posted speed limits. Um, we, could, we can use um, chemical treatments uh, to suppress dust um, if approved by environmental protection. Um, uh, so during the uh, operation, construction and operations, we will have real-time dust monitors on the project site. So um, the, the way that those work is every 15 minutes, we will get a reading of uh, TSP. So we would know almost real time whether or not we had an issue with dust and be able to react uh, quickly. And all tr workers will be trained in uh, dust management. And uh, the biggest thing you can do is if you see dust, call up somebody on the phone and say, hey, get a water truck out. Great. So we have a question from Brenane Lloyd. Um, Sandra, I, I'm going to read it aloud, but I can address this one. So Brene okay. asked, how is the Q&A from this session being documented? Uh, will will uh, it be available to access a transcript and or recording? So Brene, we record uh, the webinars and they will be available on our YouTube channel. Okay, and we have a question from Michael. Given that Perch Lake empties into Perch Creek, which empties in the Ottawa River, is the transit time from the facility to Perch Lake not also the transit time from the facility to the Ottawa River? Or is there a delay? I can reread that if you need. Yeah, uh, yes, please. <laughs> okay, so, so given that Perch Lake empties into Perch Creek, which empties into the Ottawa River, is the transit time from the facility to Perch Lake not also the transit time from the facility to the Ottawa River? Um, so this is a great question and it is a, a, a complicated uh, system, but essentially from um, the NSCF site, uh, the water that is going through the groundwater goes into Perch Creek. Um, and the transit time that we've estimated through our modeling for the groundwater from Perch from the ECM to Perch Creek is seven to 12 years. So to be conservative, we, we use uh, seven years. Um, within Perch Lake uh, to, to Perch Creek to the Ottawa River, that residence time is different. Um, so um, I don't know off the top of my head um, how quickly the water moves from Perch Lake to Perch Creek to the Ottawa River through surface water. But again, that's something um, that we can get back to you on. Okay, um, we have a question from Charlotte, which was a, very similar to um, Teresa's, but is the archeological assessment available for review? Were First Nations involved in the archeological monitoring and what stage did the assessment end at? Okay, Nicole, you might have to help me out a little bit with parts of this. No problem. Um, but definitely the archaeological report is available and we can send that to you if it's not on our website. Um, we did a four uh, stage in, um, archaeological assessment. So uh, three stages were in the field. Um, we did uh, share the archaeological reports with the identified Indigenous uh, communities and groups uh, for the NSDF project. Uh, some of the groups had more interest in others and um, we uh, received some feedback on those. And um, Nicole, I'll turn it over to you for the Indigenous involvement part. Um, so I can, uh, Charlotte, um, as part of our archaeological team is actually an external contractor. They've worked on the CNL site for many, many years now. Um, and we have a number of different uh, Indigenous um, backgrounds that are part of this crew. Um, so, and that varies from year to year, um, but yes, definitely involved in our crew work. And Charlotte, I can make sure that you get a copy of the archaeological assessment. Okay, Sandra, next question. So, Extensive epidemiological epi studies have been carried out in Europe, which pointed out huge leukemia increases among populations downstream and downwind of nuclear power plants. When will Canada implement proper studies? So 
I, before you get into this, Sandra, I, I believe it's a question that you're not able to answer, um, but it, it has been posed in our questions. Uh, that's correct. I, 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 I can't answer that at this time. Okay. So moving along, we have another question from Michael Stevens. Is there an available description of where on the CRL site the waste for NSDF will come from? Besides waste from waste management A, how much waste will come from waste management B, C, and its extension? Um, so that's a great question, Michael. Um, thank you. Um, so essentially right now we have an idea of where waste will be coming from for the different from the different waste management areas, but the key is going to be the waste characterization and ensuring that those meet the waste acceptance criteria. Uh, so we will be looking at um, waste from other waste management areas other than A and the liquid dispersal area. And our, and our goal here is to be able to remediate as much of the Chalk River site and put the, the low level waste that we have currently here into the containment mound and provide better environmental protection um, compared to what we've done uh, in the past as a legacy. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is a question from Judith. Given that the waste will remain dangerous for potentially hundreds of thousands of years, what is your long-term plan for maintaining the infrastructure and monitoring? Will this continue to be financed by Canadian taxpayers indefinitely? Do you expect the mound to continue to grow? And if so, how big will it end up being? Okay, there's lots of points to that question. Yes. Um, so I'll start with, and Nicole, you can just point out where I've missed answering something. Yes. Um, so I'll start just with that um, the NSDF will only contain low level radioactive waste, and that's uh, defined by both the Canadian Standards Association as well as the IAEA. And that's radioactive waste that contains material with a radionuclide content above established clearance levels and exemption quantities, but generally has uh, limited amounts of long-lived activity. So the NSDF limits have been set at the lower end of the definition or range that the CSA and IAEA have provided for low-level waste. So this means that um, within about 100 years, the inventory in the NSDF would decay by about a factor of 2,000. Or sorry, yes, so it decays by a factor of 2,000 within about 100 years. And at that point, it's actually very close to what you would find in natural background levels in soil. Um, the NSDF design is for 550 years. Um, we have done some studies with Queen's University to um, look at uh, the longevity of the geomembranes and we have determined with Queen's University, uh, Dr. Carrie Rowe, that the um, geomembranes can last that 550 years and some of the studies were showing that um, it would last up to 2000 years. Um, so within the project, essentially, we've looked at an institutional control period of uh, 300 years. So that would mean that the site would be under some sort of um, maintenance and monitoring for at least 300 years. Um, but what we have also found is that, again, within that first 100 years, um, the, the, with the uh, decay factor of the radioactivity, we um, it would actually be within uh, within very safe levels close to background. Um, what have I missed? Um, the size, sorry, did you cover the size? Oh, size, right. Okay, so the, the NSCF design is for 100, uh, 1 million cubic meters of low level radioactive waste. Um, we actually are um, limited uh, by our footprint in how much waste we would be able to put in. So uh, we do expect that the NSDF would operate for um, about uh, 50 to 70 years. And, um, but we, the maximum in inventory by volume would be the 1 million cubic meters of waste. And um, once that uh, was filled, the, uh, the NSDF would be closed and um, capped permanently. Okay, thank you, Sandra. We have another question from Jeanette. 
Um, would it be possible to formulate precisely the list of intermediate level radionuclides that were removed from the initial list of the project? What are you going to do with the intermediate level waste? Um, so I, I don't think I can answer the first part of that question, but um, I can say that uh, CNL does have an integrated uh, waste strategy, which is again posted on our website. Um, the intermediate level waste will continue to be safely stored here at the Chalk River Labs and, until a time where a disposal facility would be available for that waste. Okay, uh, we have another question from William Turner. Uh, with respect to the leachate pumping, my understanding is that this is for permanent disposal. What is the projected mean time between failure for these pumps? Um, we'll have to take that back to our engineers. Okay. All right, a question from Mohammed. Sandra, in recent years, environmental monitoring data detected elevated trit tritium concentrations at Perch Creek near Perch Lake, which was assessed to be coming from the reactor pit too. However, in future, this has continued to show elevated tritium and NSDF being also up gradient to the perch creep, how would you differenti differentiate the source of it from reactor pit two? Would you be collecting enough data along the down gradient perimeter that will confidently differ differentiate the tritium source from the NSDF from reactor pit two? Okay, so for the NSDF, we've actually placed very stringent limits on the total amount of tritium that can go into the NSDF. Um, and we've also put in stringent controls on um, the packaging. So any um, waste that contains tritium will go into what we call a leachate control package. So basically uh, within the NSDF, we're controlling any tritium from getting out of that package and into uh, the leachate or the contact water. Um, we are um, developing an environmental assessment follow-up monitoring program that is specific to the near surface disposal facility. Uh, that document will be available for public comment and review prior to the uh, CNSC commission meeting as well. Um, so the monitoring for the NSDF will become part of the overall environmental monitoring program for the Chalk River site, but there will be very specific um, monitoring that's done um, to make sure that our mitigation measures that are in place for NSDF are being effective. Okay, thank you, Sandra. So we have time for one last question. I think it's got us through the entire list. Uh, okay. outside of our follow-up. So the last one is from William Turner. So with respect to the latest version of the waste acceptance criteria, section 4.4 lists batteries, pressurized containers, portable fire extinguishers, and then among many other items. All of these items would be considered hazardous waste under Ontario Reg 347. Then there's a list of appliances, computers, etc. Yet section 4.1 states that hazardous wastes are explicitly excluded. Could you please explain this discrepancy? Okay, so first off, Bill, we would love to have you to come in and uh, chat with us or do a Zoom call uh, to talk a little more about the waste acceptance criteria. So anytime you wanna have a chat, we are definitely available. Um, so for hazardous waste, so first off, um, ha the hazardous waste also has to be contaminated with low level waste. So we are not using the NSDF as a hazardous waste facility. It is um, a low level waste facility. Um, what we're saying is that any hazardous waste does have to meet uh, the leachate, um, leachate testing requirements from OREG 347. Um, and OREG 347 does allow you to treat the hazardous waste in order to meet the acceptance. So I'm not sure that that entirely answers your question, but again, we would be more than willing to uh, follow up in writing or uh, have a call with you to further discuss. Okay, thank you, Sandra. You got a lot of really great questions today. I did. Um, 
We are going to wrap it up um, uh, as we have our uh, nuclear power demonstration closer project webinar at 1130. So we just want to give our um, our uh, attendees the opportunity to log off and log on to the other webinar if they're interested. So I would like to thank Sandra today uh, for joining us and providing a comprehensive uh, virtual tour of the NSDF site. And I would like to thank all of our participants for joining us today. And we will continue with bi-monthly webinar updates on all of our ERM projects. So thank you and have a great day. Thanks everyone.